Hi, second graders. Today we're going to read the book, The Boo-Boos That Changed the World, a true story about an accidental invention, really, by Barry Wittenstein. This is a very cool book because it is narrative nonfiction. What that means is that it is narrative, like a story, it's told like a story, but it is nonfiction. It is a true story. So even though it sounds like all of the other fiction stories we read, this actually happened. Once upon a time in 1917, actually, a cotton buyer named Earl Dickinson married his beloved Josephine and they lived happily ever after. The end. Actually, that was just the beginning. The newlyweds expected to live a quiet life in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Instead, Earl and Josephine ended up changing the world, one boo-boo at a time. You see, Josephine was accident prone. She often bumped and bruised herself while working around the house, but that was nothing compared to how often she injured herself in the kitchen. Ouch! When she sliced and diced an onion, she sometimes sliced her finger too. Boo-hoo! When she grated cheese, she sometimes grated her knuckle. Ah! When she lifted a hot pot off the stove, she sometimes burned her hand. Second graders, are there times when you hurt yourself by accident? After Josephine winced in pain, she quickly grabbed a rag to stop the bleeding. But with bulky towels between her fingers, it was even harder for Josephine to hold a knife. She became even more accident prone. Impossible, you say? It's true. Josephine's klutziness had become a bloody problem. Every night when Earl came home from work, he looked forward to talking with Josephine and eating the wonderful meal she had prepared. That was until he saw his beloved's hands. Yikes! Her cuts might get infected. He had to help his new bride. Earl's father was a doctor, so Earl knew a little bit about boo-boos and bandages. And luckily, he worked for a company that manufactured hospital supplies. That means they made hospital supplies. Earl knew there had to be a solution, but what was it? Earl thought while he shaved in the morning, maybe if I... Earl thought while he bought cotton in the afternoon, then I could... And Earl thought some more while he lay in bed at night. And that would solve. Finally, a light bulb went off over his head. I've got it, Earl yelled with excitement, waking up Josephine. What have you got? She asked. The bloody solution, of course, Earl replied. Look at Earl's face. How do you think he's feeling in each of these pictures? The next morning, Earl tried out his idea. Step one, he took a long piece of adhesive tape and laid it on the kitchen table, sticky side up. Step two, Earl cut small squares of sterile gauze and stuck them on the tape every few inches. Step three, he placed a material called crinoline on top of the adhesive tape to keep the whole strip sterile. Sterile means clean. It's perfect, Earl said proudly. Now all Josephine had to do was cut off a piece of the longer strip and put it on. She didn't need anybody's help. She needed only one hand. It worked. At last, they lived happily ever after. The end. But wait! Here comes the part about how Earl and Josephine changed the whole world. Earl guessed there were probably hundreds, possibly even thousands of people who could benefit from his new invention. Earl and Josephine thought about making the bandages themselves, but they soon realized it was too big a job. Earl told one of his coworkers about it, and the coworker encouraged Earl to meet with the company's president. At first, Earl's boss, James Johnson, wasn't quite sure Earl's idea was good enough. Earl demonstrated how easy it was to put the bandage on. Then Mr. Johnson saw his own light bulb. The company agreed to produce and sell the product. They combined the words bandage and first aid to create the clever name Band-Aid. Look at the picture of Earl's boss. There isn't really a light bulb over his head. 
What does it mean when an illustrator puts a light bulb over a character's head? Now, Earl and Josephine would surely live happily ever after because Band-Aids were guaranteed to be an instant success. And with that, we have come to the end. Thank you and good night. Oops, not yet, sorry. That first year, Band-Aids were made in a factory. It was a slower than slow process and only a small number could be manufactured by hand. They came rolled up and were 18 ridiculous inches long and three ridiculous inches wide, and they still had to be cut into pieces. Earl, Josephine, and Mr. Johnson had high expectations, but the Band-Aid boxes collected dust, ignored and unwanted. Why do you think people weren't interested in Band-Aids? A few years later, the company invented a machine that could mass produce thousands of the bandages. Instead of the user having to cut them up, each one was ready to go. Band-Aids were now about three inches long and an inch wide, and they were cute too. Each one had a little red string to pull in order to open the paper wrapper. Success! Band-Aids flew off the shelves. The end. Not really. Unfortunately, even with the cute red string and the convenient size, the public wasn't sold on the idea. Mr. Johnson knew there had to be a solution. What happened next was truly a stroke of genius. The company decided to give the Band-Aids away. Mr. Johnson wondered who needed self-adhesive bandages the most. And then that light bulb went off again. The Boy Scouts, of course, all those fall down, climb up, scratched elbows, scraped knees boys got plenty of cuts. It didn't take long before the mothers of those rough and tumble boys saw how handy the little bandages were. That did it. Earl and Josephine's invention was a smash. During World War II, the company sent millions of free band-aids to the brave soldiers fighting overseas. In the years that followed, Band-Aids were made in different sizes, colors, and designs. Some even had pictures of cartoon characters on them. And that continues to this day all over the world. From boisterous hot dog vendors in Brooklyn, fancy French winemakers, tired taxi drivers in Denmark, and English bobbies on bicycles, to daredevil skateboarders in Saskatchewan, king crab fishermen in Alaska, sweaty Ugandan soccer players, and applauding audiences at the Bolshoi Theater in Moscow, the sounds of a hi, wah, an ouch echo still, but not for long. Because soon those snivels and sobs of pain are silenced by Earl and Josephine's accidental boo-boo invention. And that is the happiest ending of all. The end, really. If you'd like to read the author's note, which includes more information about this invention, and also this timeline, which tells you the order of events and when they happened, you can pause the video here and watch them and read them. Once you have finished, try and summarize this story to someone at home. You can use words like first, then, next, or last. Also, tell the person at home what your favorite part of the story was. And lastly, do you think that there is a lesson for us to learn? Here's a bonus question. Can you explain what narrative nonfiction is? If you don't remember, go back to the beginning of this video and listen to what narrative nonfiction is and then see if you can put it in your own words. I hope you enjoyed reading this story.